Good morning again. Um, if you're not familiar with the information that we share, then <clears throat> you probably think that the presentations yesterday were a little bit scattered, and they were, but um, we're going to try to be more focused today. And the reason that I was jumping around yesterday was to try to touch a few points that we're going to focus in on today to try to, to acquaint them to you before we got there so that you wouldn't be totally unfamiliar as we settle into these things today. Uh, here is an illustration. Um, if this was a classroom and I was a teacher and you were the students, I would tell you this is something that you should be putting in your notes. We're going to spend a great deal of time. The rest of the day is going to be dealing with this particular um, illustration, and I'm going to build on it. When it gets done, you're going to say it's so cluttered that it's unbelievable, um, but we're going to do the starting point here. We have, I'm not forgetting about Islam. I mentioned Islam. We're going to get to Islam. What we are suggesting going to try to show you today is that from 1840 to 1844 is a sacred history when the power of God was manifested. And we need to um, recognize that this is a history that illustrates the manifestation of the power of God, because at the end of the world, when the power of God is manifested again in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, we need to recognize it, and we will recognize the manifestation of the power of God and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit by understanding that the histories, the biblical histories that have prefigured the outpouring of the Holy Spirit are being repeated. It's by recognizing that the repetition of these history has begun that we will understand that the latter rain is beginning to fall. So, in terms of this sacred history, um, William Miller began to present the first angel's message in 1831. Uh, to me, this is an important point I am making here. It wasn't until August 11th, 1840, that the first angel's message was empowered. Um, we're going to read you the quote, so you can see it for yourself. You've read it before, but it may not have struck your attention. But in June of 1842, the organized churches began to close their doors upon the Millerite message. And therefore, at that point in history, the second angel's message arrived in history. The Millerites did not understand that. In the book that we've been referring to by Dam Steed, he discusses the fact that it wasn't until the 1844 time period that the Millerites themselves began to understand that when what was going on with the Protestant churches was a fulfillment of the second angel's message, and then they had some serious discussions among themselves. If the Protestant churches are rejecting this message, um, does this mean that we're actually supposed to call people out of the Protestant churches in fulfillment of the second angel's message? And they didn't want to do it. They said, you know, we don't want to go into our church family and say, you need to come out of this church family and stand with us Millerites. So there was a, there was a hesitancy. And then finally... And I, I, I could be wrong in this, but I think it was Joseph Bates published an article um, where he nailed it down that we need to call the people out of Babylon and the churches that have closed their doors to the Millerite message are Babylon. And once that article came out, then the floodgates were opened and the Millerites began to call people out of the fallen churches. But that wasn't until here. But technically... The second angel's message began, arrived in June of 1842. So what I'm wanting you to see, this seems important to me, is that the first angel's message came into history, but at some point later it is empowered. The first angel's message was empowered on August 11th, 1840 with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. The second angel's message came into history, but it was not till the midnight cry at the Exeter, New Hampshire camp meeting from August 12th through 17th, where Samuel Snow presented his understanding, and then the midnight cry swept across the, the nation in just basically two months. The, the message of the hour went across the entire United States in a time period when there was no 
airplanes, there was no automobiles, there was no internet, there was no telephones, and in two months, the message swept across the United States because the Holy Spirit had been poured out without measure at this point. So, the third angel's message arrived on October 22, 1844. Did those brethren that were following the light at that time understand the third angel's message? No, but it arrived at this time because the, Christ had moved into the most holy place and technically by faith then you could look into the most holy place and see the Ark of the Covenant and look into the Ark of the Covenant and see the Sabbath and understand the connection between Sabbath and Sunday. The third angel's message arrives in history October 22, 1844, and at some point in history, the third angel's message also will be empowered. And when is the third angel's message in power? When the fourth angel of Revelation 18 joins it. Um, and so what I'm wanting you to see in terms of the, the attributes of these messages... The message arrives in history, and at some point, it's empowered. The message arrives in history, at some point, it's empowered. The message arrives in history, at some point, it's empowered. This is an attribute that, in my mind, is important to see as we begin to see how this history is repeated. So, um, take note of that. Now, Sister White says, uh, I get in trouble for using colored markers. I have blue, red, and green. If I'm going to use a colored marker, which should I use? Blue and green. Blue and green. I'm, when I went in the Air Force, the brother that was testing for color blindness, this officer says, you're the worst I've ever seen. So I have to take counsel on colors. Um, I'm, I'm not dogmatic about this, but when it comes to the seven thunders, when Sister White says the seven thunders represent a delineation of events that transpired, During the first and second angel's messages, she's talking about events. And in the other paragraph, she says the seven thunders represent future events that will be disclosed in their orders. So I'm dogmatic about this. I believe whatever the seven thunders are, they are emphasizing events. I'm not so dogmatic about I could be wrong on what the events are. But I'm going to tell you what I think the seven thunder events are, just so we put this in the record. This history, the events that, from my understanding, inspiration deals with most often is the empowerment of the first angel's message. Um, The second angel's message arrives in 1842. And then we have the first disappointment. What was the first disappointment? It was this here, right? They believed the Lord was coming back in 1843. So when did the first disappointment arrive? It arrived in 1844, in March 21st, 1844, because the Millerites were working off the biblical reckoning of time, and they believed that the year 1843 biblically began on March 21st, 1843, and therefore the year 1843 ended on March 21st, 1844. So they believed the Lord was returning in 1843, and they, they gave the whole year, they waited for the whole year for him to fulfill his word. So the first disappointment in reality arrives in 1844, in, in March, March 21st. And then this begins what is identified in the parable of the ten virgins, and which Sister White talks about, the tarrying time. So I would say the tarrying time is also one of the events that is marked in inspiration. And then Sister White um, begins to tell us that the second angel's message was proclaimed in the summer of 1844. And the proclamation of the second angel's message is something that inspiration speaks about. And then the second angel's message is empowered at the midnight cry. And then on October 22nd, 1844, the door is closed. So for me... I could be wrong on some of the emphasis here, but these are the events that I see inspiration dwelling on most often in this history, and there are seven of them. Um, Now, if you would turn with me 
to Revelation chapter 9, verse 15. I want to show you a, a, the prophecy that empowered the first angel's message, but I want to show you a, a prophetic characteristic of this that is not usually pointed out. In chapter 9 of Revelation, you have the first and second woe, the fifth and sixth trumpet. And in the sixth trumpet, in verse 13, it says this. Everyone at the sixth trumpet in verse 13? And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay a third part of men. <clears throat> if the angels were loosed, prior to being loosed, what were they? They were restrained. So they're, they're here, um, the the understanding, the correct understanding, I believe, of, uh, of this time prophecy is that on July 27th, um, 1449, <clears throat> the four angels are loosed. And they, these four angels are representing the four great sultans of Turkey of the Ottoman Empire that are going to bring warfare against the Europeans for an hour, month, day, and a year, which if you compute that in time prophecy, is 391 years and 15 days. And they bring this warfare against Europe for this time period. And then on August 11th, 1840, they are restrained when the four great European powers intercede into the, the warfare that's going on between Egypt and Turkey. And the, the leader of Turkey surrenders his sovereignty to the Europeans so that they can handle Egypt for him. But that isn't what I want you to see here, although the, we, we should be familiar with that, because this prophecy is, is foundational to Adventism. This is what confirms the year-day principle before the world. But what I want you to see, if you will, is this. This time prophecy begins with, is it three or five angels that are loosed? It's four angels that are loosed. Okay, so although this isn't going to be proportional, back here in 1449, we have four angels that are loosed, and therefore, prophetically, on August 11th, 1840, we see four angels restrained. Follow the logic? If they were loosed at the beginning of the prophecy, at the end of the prophecy, they are restrained. And there are four of them. And what I'm going to suggest to you as we proceed here is that the time period from 1840 to 1844 is a history that is illustrating the sealing time. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we understand that at the beginning of this sealing time, four angels are going to restrain the four winds. So I want you to see that at the beginning of this history, we have four angels that are restrained, that is paralleling the restraining work of the four angels in Revelation 17. It's just one component that, I'm, that I want to mark in this history. Follow the logic, even if you don't buy it, okay? Four angels, okay. Um, so we've already taken note last night that what one of the ways to express what took place on August 11th, 1840, was that the four, European, the four great European powers came together to decide the fate of Islam. And I, I like to express it that way because we're suggesting that is what is going to be repeated here at the end of time. Um, let me see if I want to put any more components on that before we take the next step. Uh, that will probably... Get us started. <clears throat> In the handouts that we presented to you, one of the points that we dwell on is that 
in prophecy, Jesus has portrayed himself as the first and the last. He is the one that portrays the end of the world from the beginning of the world. And if you look at Isaiah 44, 6 through 8, in connection with this, and there is a couple verses in Isaiah where this truth is identified. Isaiah 44, verse 6, if you're there, say amen. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and besides, beside me there is no God, and who, as I, shall call, and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming, and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time? and have declared it. Ye are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. And this is just one place in Isaiah where this truth is identified, and the truth that I'm pointing to, because there's more than one in these verses, is that in Christ's work of portraying the end with the beginning, he specifically points out that he appointed the ancient people. The ancient people uh, at the beginning are what he uses to illustrate the end. And we understand this as Adventists. We understand um, that we, as modern Israel, have been prefigured by ancient Israel. We understand that um, Nimrod's Babel prefigures Babylon at the end of the world. That's pretty easy for us as Seventh-day Adventists. But I would submit to you that one of the ancient people that God appointed was Abraham's firstborn son. And who was Abraham's firstborn son? Ishmael. I'm not suggesting that he's the inheritor of the covenant promises. I know better than that, and so do you. But in Bible prophecy, the number 12, and this is an easy one, and I sometimes get people all nervous that I'm saying that the numbers in the Bible actually represent something. But brothers and sisters, every fact in the Bible has a meaning. And the number 12 in Bible prophecy represents God's kingdom. There's the 12 um, tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples, the 12 foundations to the city, the 12 gates to the city. All you need to establish the truth is two or three. So the number 12 is a, a marker of God's kingdom. And Abraham's firstborn, Ishmael, was the father of how many nations? 12. Um, this is a way that the Bible is telling us that somehow, some way, Ishmael has a connection with God's people, even though he is not the inheritor of the covenant promises. One that we don't stumble over... Um, a truth that we, don't understand, that we don't stumble over in terms of um, God's kingdom is the 12 sons of Jacob. And if you turn to um, Genesis 49, I, would, I want to show you something. Um, Genesis 49, verse 1, says this. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you what will befall you in the last days. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, <clears throat> and this is that their father spake unto them and blessed them, every one according to his blessing. He blessed them. These blessings upon the twelve sons of Jacob were prophecies about how, how those twelve sons were going to play a role at the end of the world. And I'm not suggesting in a literal fashion. fashion. They are, are going to be spiritually represented at the end of the world. <clears throat> so all I'm saying is that when it comes to the descendants of Abraham here in Jacob's sons, that these sons had prophecies associated with them that were to be applied at the end of the world. And in Pro Patriarchs and Prophets, Sister White gives a second testimony to this truth. It says, Patriarchs and Prophets 2.35, At the last, all the sons of Jacob were gathered about his dying bed, and Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together. And um, dropping down, it says, 
Uh, now, as his children waited to receive his last blessing, the spirit of inspiration rested upon him, and before him in prophetic vision, the future of his descendants was unfolded. One after another, the names of his sons were mentioned, the character of each was described, and the future history of the tribes was briefly foretold. So we see that in Abraham's descendants, there is, they are one group of the ancient people that have been appointed by Christ to illustrate the end of the world. In Isaiah, he was, he was identifying, emphasizing once again that as the first and the last, he portrays the end of the world from the beginning of the world. And he tells us, and by the way, when I'm portraying the end of the world from the beginning of the world, I have appointed certain people to be the illustrations at the end of the world. And an easy one to see is Jacob. But if you turn um, to Genesis you can put this in your notes, Genesis 17.20 is where um, we're told that um, Ishmael has 12 princes that he were his descendants. But in Genesis, where we read last night, um, 14, I believe that this is um, the, did I say 14? Genesis 16, that this is the, the similar prediction about the role that the ancient person Ishmael will play at the end of the world and his descendants. In chapter 16 of Genesis, verse, let's start in verse 11, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, unto Hagar, Behold, thou art with child, and, bear, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. I'm submitting here into the, the record that uh, what I am understanding about this ancient person is that Ishmael has a specific role to play in Bible prophecy. And the role is, is that he is going to be a wild man, his descendants will be however you want to express the word, word wild, but it, it relates to the fact that they're going to be against every other man on planet Earth. And their antagonism towards every other man on planet Earth is the issue that brings all of planet Earth's hands, all of planet Earth together against them. There are a few things in Bible prophecy, in end-time Bible prophecy, that that have not been firmly established in Adventism. Some people believe some of these things, some people believe part of these things, and some people don't believe any of these things. And the few things that I'm speaking about are that their Bible prophecy is very clear that there will be a one world government at the end of time. Now, I'm, I'm certain that there's a lot of Adventists that don't understand that, but if you use the simple rules of prophecy, it is very clear and very easy to sustain that. Um, we haven't the time to do that. I can point you to the 40-hour prophecy school where we take the time to demonstrate that. It is not a minor teaching. It is a major teaching. Um, another thing that we're foggy on is the role of uh, Islam and connected to the one world government we are not clear that the one world government is the United Nations. The United Nations is definitely pointed out in Bible prophecy specifically. Okay, and it takes a little bit of time to, to demonstrate that, but it's not until you understand that that you can understand the role of Islam in bringing about a crisis upon planet Earth that gives the logic, places the logical argument in the hands of the United States for the United States to turn to the world and say, the only way that we can deal with this escalating crisis of Islam is to bring the world under the umbrella of a one world government where the, all the nations of the world surrender their national sovereignty and we can respond to these escalating attacks of Ishmael's descendants. They are the issue that brings every man's hand together against them. 
Um, and there are a number of ways to demonstrate this. I have not the time to go there, unfortunately, this morning, but I at least have to tell you that that's how I'm relating to these things so that you can see the logic that I'm going to continue making here. Ishmael has a role to play in Bible prophecy. And as Ishmael's descendants spread out and commingled, the Bible came up with a general term for the descendants of Ishmael, and it's called the children of the East. And if you trace the children of the East through Bible prophecy, you will see that they've always had a connection with ancient Israel, and it was a double-edged sword. They were used by the Lord to bring judgment against Israel, but they are also used to be a deliverer for Israel at different points in time. At some points in time, they would bring judgment to God's people. At other points in time, they would bring deliverance. Uh, this is easy to document. Um, it was the Midianite traders that were passing by when Joseph was about to be murdered by his brothers. And the Midianites, the descendants of Ishmael, the children of the east provided deliverance for Joseph and therefore for all of Israel because Joseph was used to provide deliverance for Israel. So there's times um, when they, they're bringing a blessing. Uh, it was the, the wise men from the east that provided the financial uh, ability for Joseph to flee to Egypt and preserve Christ as a baby. The wise men of the east brought that blessing. In the sanctuary service, uh, the incense that were to be used to correctly run the incense are only grown in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, and it, that meant that the Jews always had to maintain, they were forced to maintain a, uh, a merchant relationship with the children of the East in spite of whatever went on behind, between them. There was always a relationship between them. Um, by the way... How, how many of the wise men brought the gifts to Jesus? Good, good. All right. Um, we won't go there then. In, in history, after biblical times, when the Catholic Church took control of the world, it was the Islam of the fifth and sixth trumpet, actually the fifth trumpet very rapidly, wrapped itself geographically around Europe and prevented Catholicism from spreading around the world. So even in, the, in that time period, there was a deliverance that was being given to God's people, to the world, restraining Catholicism there in Europe. Um, if you're familiar of the, the, the streams of uh, manuscripts which produce the Bible, there are basically two streams. The, the received text, the Vaticanus, and I know that I'm stepping on some toes here, but in any case, it was the scholars of Islam that were the premier um, historical figures that preserved the received text in their desire for education. So they, they had a part to play in preserving the most important manuscripts from which we get our Bible. Um, at the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, uh, Martin Luther identified Islam as the deliverer of the Protestant Reformation. He said it specifically because every time uh, the Roman Church was going to come down and try to stomp out the reformers with their army, Islam would invade Europe from the north and the armies would have to be turned around to prevent um, Islam, or Europe being overrun by Islam. So the early reformers understood that Islam was being used as a deliverer for the Protestant Reformation. So Islam in Bible times and in post-Bible times has been a double-edged sword that brings not only deliverance from time to time to God's people, but it brought judgment against God's people from time to time. In fact, in the fifth trumpet, there is a command to hurt not those that have the seal of God. And if you go back to, there's a, a manuscript of, from the first, it's Abu Bakr, from one of the first generals after Muhammad passed away, that he give, actually 
his, in history, the, the command is still recorded where he gives the command to hurt not those Christians, and he makes a distinction um, which, as Adventists, we can look back and see that the distinction that he's making between the Christians is those Christians that are keeping the Sabbath, leave them alone, and those Christians that are keeping Sunday, if they won't bow and accept Muhammad as the prophet, then cut their head off. So there was actually a historical <clears throat> fulfillment of this preservation of the Sabbath-keeping Christians that Islam undertook as it brought its warfare against Europe. Um, <clears throat> that this is not so in important to our text, to our study, but I want to put that in place. Islam has brought judgment and deliverance, and from my understanding, I believe that Islam is the active ingredient that is associated with the third woe, and it is the power that is going to bring about the environment where the United States passes a Sunday law, and then the environment where the United States forces the world to come under the umbrella of a one-world government. Because in the first woe, Islam was to hurt the armies of Rome, and in the second woe, it was to kill the armies of Rome. And so there's a twofold process. But in those histories, somehow, some way, and I don't, and I really don't have, I don't have a guess at this, but I understand the principle. Somehow, some way, in this crisis of Islam, Islam is going to provide an environment where God's people do carry the final warning message to the world. They're going to provide some kind of issue that allows us to finish the work in agreement with their past history of both delivering God's people from time to time and bringing judgment. So that being said, um, <clears throat> I believe that one of the ancient people that has been appointed is the descendants of Ishmael. And what they've been appointed to do is to bring about the angering of the nations. Um, turn with me to Revelation 11. In Revelation 11, I mentioned last night that early on, after 1844, Joseph Bates wrote an article where he said that verse 18 was describing one event. This is the characteristics of one event. And verse 18 of Revelation 11 says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest givest reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Shortly after Joseph Bates um, put out that article, Sister White came out with an article, and you can find it in early writings, and I'm just going to take a, a portion of it. It's from early writings, page 36, and it says this, I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate and distinct, one following the other. Also that Michael had not stood up, and that the time of trouble such as never was has not yet commenced. The nations are now getting angry. But when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary, he will stand up, put on the garments of vengeance, and then shall the seven last plagues be poured out. I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary, and then will come the seven last plagues. Sister White says these events here in verse 18 are separate, distinct, and they're, they're in a specific order there in verse 18. And the wrath of God, the second point in verse 18, thy wrath has come, is the, identifying the seven last plagues. The seven last plagues begin when human probation closes, when Michael stands up. Um, therefore, the angering of the nations comes before human probation closes. If you turn back for a moment to Revelation 10, Revelation 10, verse 7, says this. And there's a, there's a lot of information in verse 7. I'm just going to take one small point. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, brothers and sisters, chapter 10 has followed chapter 8 and chapter 9. And in chapter 8 and chapter 9, you have the first six trumpets. And here in verse 7, you have the, the sounding of the seventh trumpet. 
The first four trumpets were the historical forces that brought to a conclusion Western Rome. The the next two trumpets, the fifth and sixth trumpet, which were the first and second woe, which are described in chapter 9, was Islam, and in the history of Islam, Eastern Rome, Constantinople, came to a conclusion, and during the history of the first and second woe, the papacy also received its deadly wound. So you come to chapter 9, and in the final trumpet in chapter 9, which is the sixth trumpet, you have the 391-year, 15-day time prophecy that has a direct connection with the Millerite time period because this is the prophetic truth that empowered the first angel's message. So as John is setting forth the trumpets for us, when he gets to the sixth trumpet, Before he jumps right into the seventh trumpet, he makes sure that we understand that the sixth trumpet has a relationship with the Millerite time period because he introduces chapter 10. And chapter 10, chapter 10, brothers and sisters, is a chapter that not only describes the Millerite time period, but it describes the time period of the 144,000. And in the chapter 10, you see the seventh trumpet sounding Um, This is the seventh trumpet following the first six. And the pioneers correctly understood that the seventh trumpet began to sound on October 22nd, 1844. So you see it sounding in in verse 7. And then if you go to chapter 11, in verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded. This This is a repeat and enlarge upon verse 7 of chapter 10. Verse 7 says the seventh angel sounded, and now verse 15 is going to add some more to that information. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and which was and which art to come, because thou hast taken thee great power and hast reigned. Now, brothers and sisters, Verse 15 introduces us to the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and then it it gives this portrayal of what's going on in the sanctuary above during this time period. And you'll find this portrayal, these illustrations, in a few places in Revelation, and they're worth understanding correctly, but I'm passing over them because it's not the focus now. But what I want you to see, if you will, is that John says, here's the sounding of the seventh trumpet in verse 15. And then he steps back and he tells what's going on in the, the temple above. And then it's not until verse 18 that he, that he goes ahead and he's going to start telling us now about the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And it's verse 18, it says, and the nations are angry. An attribute of the seventh trumpet is that the seventh trumpet is identifying the angering of the nations. And the seventh trumpet, brothers and sisters, is the third woe. And what I'm trying to emphasize here is that the third woe, somehow, some way, it is the, <clears throat> it is the, <clears throat> the, the power or the, the symbol. Or it's the, it represents the events that anger the nations. The angering of the nations is a subject of Bible prophecy. And what I'm saying to you is, is that the seventh trumpet is the third woe, and the first two woes were Islam. They operate under the principle of a triple application of prophecy, defining for us that the third woe will be Islam. And one of the prophetic attributes of Islam is that they are the power that angers the nations, and this is in agreement with the pronouncement in Genesis, where we are told that descendants of Ishmael, their hands will be against every man, and every man's hand will be against them. This is the role that they play. They are the ones that anger the nations prior to the close of human probation. The Paulson Collection 196 says this, The end of all things at his hand, and the message of warning must be given, A spirit of anger is stirring the nations, and it will soon be too late to work for the Lord. Selected Messages, book 1, page 221, says, 
We are standing on the threshold of great and solemn events. Prophecies are fulfilling strange and eventful history is being recorded in the books of heaven. Events which it was declared should shortly precede the day of God. Everything in the world is in an unsettled state. The nations are angry and great preparations for war are being made. Nation is plotting against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Review and Herald, November 27, 1900 says, Already kingdom is rising against kingdom. There is not now a determined engagement, as yet the four winds are held until the servants of God shall be sealed in their forehead. And, and the reason I read those quotes is I'm trying to broaden our understanding of the angering of the nations to understand that the, these four winds are also an expression of the angering of the nations. And hopefully you'll see what I mean in a moment. Now, before I proceed, I know that inspiration is very clear that the four, the four winds of strife are not released completely and fully until human probation closes. We're told that very specifically. But we're also told that the four winds begin to blow prior to the close of human probation. It's like they're slipping through the, the angel's hands um, prior to the close of probation. So we need to understand that the work of the four winds, the strife of the nations, is something that escalates, although it doesn't reach its most profound manifestation until human probation closes. Um, I'm suggesting now, if, if I haven't said it plainly, I'll say it plainly, um, that Islam is also the primary ingredient of the four winds in the sense that winds represent warfare and strife. They are the issue that um, produces this condition prior to the Sunday law and the implementation of the image of the beast upon the world. The Great Controversy 439 says, Winds are a symbol of strife. The four winds of heaven striving upon the great sea represent the terrible scenes of conquest and revolution by which kingdoms have attained to power. Um, Review and Herald, June 7th, 1887 says, Four mighty angels are still holding the four winds of earth. Terrible destruction is forbidden to come in full. The accidents by land and sea, the loss of life, Steadily increasing by storm, by tempest, by railroad disaster, by conflagration, the terrible floods, the earthquakes. The winds will be stirring up of, and the winds will be the stirring up of the nations to one deadly combat. I hope we can see that that's going on today. Now, in terms of, of these winds, preceding the close of probation. Early writings, page 38, says, I asked my accompanying angel the meaning of what I heard and what the four angels were about to do. He said to me that it was God that restrained the powers and that he gave his angels charge over the things on the earth, that the four winds, that the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds and that they were about to let them go. But while their hands were loosening and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed upon the remnant that were not sealed. And he raised his hands to the Father and pleaded with him that he had spilled his blood for them. So there's a loosening of the four winds. It's an escalation. Testimonies, volume 6, page 408 says, the restraining spirit of God is now being withdrawn from the world. This is an escalation. Um, <clears throat> Christ Object Lessons, page 127. In every age, there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. In every age, there's a new, a new aspect of truth for that particular generation. So you and I should expect to be um, seeing new light. I know some people, they really have a problem with, with the idea of discussing new light. But brothers and sisters, in every age... Jesus unfolds new light to that generation, particularly the final generation where the great controversy meets, meets its conclusion here on planet Earth. I'm not denying what takes place at the end of the thousand years, but in every age there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are, are all essential. 
New truth is not independent of old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them all the scriptures in all the scriptures, the thing concerning himself. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. I would submit to you that from our human understanding, what we're sharing here this week is based and built upon the foundational truths of Adventism, which are represented upon that church truth. You, that's Christ's Object Lessons, page 127. So, let me submit something to you that requires, in my mind, a little bit of thinking, but this is a, a very provocative passage here. This is Selected Messages, Book 3, page 409. Angels are holding the four winds, represented by an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. Now, brothers and sisters, where does the Bible describe the four winds of strife? Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3, correct? Do you see an angry horse in Revelation 7, verses 1 through 3? No angry horse there. Doesn't mention a horse at all in Revelation 7, 1 through 3. And Sister White just said to us that the four winds of strife, which are addressed in Revelation 7, 1 through 3, they're represented by an angry horse that's about to break loose over the whole earth. Isn't that, isn't that what she just said? Angels are holding the four winds, represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush over the face of the whole earth, bearing destruction and death in its path. Sister White's here speaking about the four winds of strife in Revelation 7, and she says they're symbolized by an angry horse. And there's no angry horse in Revelation 7. But do you know something, brothers and sisters? The fifth and sixth trumpet, the first and second woe, you know what the symbols of Islam in the first and second woe are? Look at that chart. It's right here. It's an angry horse. It's a war horse seeking to break loose over the whole earth. Sister White says that chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered. We're suggesting that the, the strife that's brought upon the world is Islam in agreement with the prophetic role of Islam, and that Islam is the one that brings every man's hand together at the end of the world into a one world government. Now, um, 10 minutes, let me, we have more to say about this. You read chapter 9, where the first and second woe, the fifth and sixth trumpet are, are identified, and you'll see that Islam is, is portrayed upon with the terms of this horse, this war horse. So I don't know where else you can go um, in Revelation to make this connection other than what Sister White is suggesting to us is that Islam is what brings the strife represented by the four winds. There's more arguments on this. I want to give you one in nine minutes and 19 seconds. Uh, and this is a... This is an easy one. It takes a little bit of time. It's one, unfortunately, that we should all understand, but generally we don't. And brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to speak down to anyone. The things that I present, I may sound like I've understood these for years, but I don't. I'm in the, I understand some things wrong. But it's my conviction that we should understand the basics of Adventism, and this one is a basic of Adventism. Revelation 13.2 says that the dragon gave three things to the papacy, its power, seat, and authority. If you could resurrect the pioneers of Adventism, Andrews, Loughborough, White, and you ask them what it, 
what it meant that pagan Rome gave its power, its seat, and its authority to the papacy, they would all be able to give you several sermons on each of these historical events. Yet here at the end of the world, Seventh-day Adventists are unfamiliar with what the history is around the fact that pagan Rome gave its power, its seat, and its civil authority to the papacy. Okay, we don't understand that any longer, and I, I personally think we should. I'm going to Take just one of those things, just one of those things. Pioneers will correctly tell you, the historians will confirm it, that in the year 533, Justinian gave the civil authority of the Roman Empire into the hands of the papacy. How did he do this? Um, by issuing a decree, the, the decree of Justinian. And when you look at the pioneer writings, more often than not, the pioneers will quote the entire decree. I say that because the decree is rather long, and there's only a portion of it that really is what we are looking for, but the pioneers understood that the decree of Justinian was so significant that generally they quote the entire thing. If you want to see the decree of Justinian, just open Uriah Smith's book. In this time period, 533, now brothers and sisters, in the year 330, um, Constantine moved the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople, and from that point on, the Roman Empire began to disintegrate. And after 330, the seven trumpets of Revelation began to blow. And the seven trumpets are the historical force, the barbarians, the vandals, that begin to take apart the Roman Empire piece by piece. It begins to crumble. So when you get to the year 533, the emperor Justinian, He's, he's the emperor of Rome, but he's in a time period where he's watching his empire disintegrate. And there are two, two issues that the pioneers and historians will point out that Justinian was dealing with. One, he had the political crisis going on in his kingdom, that it was being taken apart by these military powers. And there was also a religious argument going on in his kingdom uh, simplifying it down, I understand its connection with some of the theology. But the, the religious crisis was this, in a simple form. Was the church in Rome the preeminent Christian church, or was the church in Constantinople the preeminent Christian church? And Justinian determined that it was for his best political expediency to identify, to enter into the religious realm, even though he was a civil figure, to identify that the Church of Rome was the preeminent Christian church. So he made a decree identifying the Pope of Rome as the head of the churches and as the corrector of heretics. And that decree was in 533, so technically, didn't happen, but technically at that time, the Pope of Rome could turn to Justinian and say, you're a heretic, off with your head. Technically, in 533, pagan Rome gave its civil authority to the papacy. Now, they, they didn't begin to exercise that power and authority until the year 533, when the third horn was removed, when the Goths fled the city of Rome. But what I want you to see is that in 533, the civil authority of the Roman Empire was turned over to the papacy by the civil authority of the Roman Empire. Why does that matter? Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation 17. Revelation 17, usually when I share Revelation 17, the way that I prefer to share it takes about two hours. Um, we're not going through Revelation 17 here. Uh, we're just going to make um, one point about it. in four minutes. Uh, this, is, this will be a tricky one. Um, I, I, I can't make it. If I'm going to take a little bit longer. I'm going to use the, the beginning of next presentation to finish this. We're going to start it here. I'm going to tell you what my points are um, a little bit broader than I wanted to. In verse 1 of Revelation 17, it says, And there was one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Brothers and sisters, here's what I would like you to test of this verse. There is no reason whatsoever that we have to be told which angel it is 
that gives John this vision, but we are. We're specifically told that the angel that brings the vision of Revelation 17 to John is one of the angels that poured out the seven last plagues. Therefore, there is a purposeful connection between Revelation 16 and 17. It could have just been that there was an angel that came to John, but that isn't what it says. It's one of the angels that poured out the vials. Therefore, as a student of prophecy, we must say, okay, why are we told that the angel that brings this message to John was one of the angels that poured out the seven last plagues? There has to be some reason for that. There is no accidents in the word of God. So with that being said, I'll tell you what I think the reason is. The reason is, is when you become, when you're going to approach Revelation 17 and try to figure out the mystery, five have fallen, one is and one is yet to come, and the eighth is of the seven, that you must do it in the context of Revelation 17, 16. And Revelation 16 talks about modern Babylon at the end of the world, and it says it comes in three parts, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. So what I'm suggesting is when you deal with Revelation 17, you need to be able to identify the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Okay, and I, I, I spend a lot more time on that usually. Another verse in Revelation 17 that I want you to test on your own time is verse 3. This is the one that destroys virtually every of the thoughts on Revelation 17 in Adventism today. If you won't be fair-minded and correct on verse 3, then you'll come up with a strange idea on Revelation 17 almost every time. Revelation 17, verse 3 says, So he carried me away in the Spirit into the wilderness. And in Revelation 12, 6 and verse 14, there's two verses in Revelation 12, verse 6 and verse 14, the wilderness is identified as the 1260 years of papal rule. John is carried forward in history into the Dark Ages time period in order to see the Roman church. He had to. He received the vision in the year 100. The Roman church did not exist. If he was going to see a vision of the Roman church, he had to be carried to a point in history when the Roman church existed. And therefore, in verse 30, he is carried into the Dark Ages. And when he receives his vision, he has to be somewhere in the Dark Ages. So those in Adventism that say these kings that Five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, that they're popes since the Lateran Treaty in 1929. Can't be. John wasn't in 1929. He was in the Dark Ages. All right? That's, that's the logic of verse 3. There's more to be said about it. And we will take this up in our next presentation because we are now down to 36 seconds. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we ask that you continue to guide us into all truth, that you would do what it takes, that we can be successful students of prophecy. But we do not want to be simply those that understand prophecy and are ultimately classified as nothing more than a sounding gong. We need that love as well. We need your character. But we know that you have said that at the end of the world that we are Laodiceans that are unaware of our needs and that you also intend to wake us up to, th to this condition through your prophetic word. So we ask that your prophetic word is not only a gathering together of information, but that your Holy Spirit uses, us, uses it to awaken us to our condition that we might attain that character that the world is so desperately needing to see in order to come and stand with your people here at this final moment in time. We thank you for the work that you're attempting to accomplish in us, and we ask you to continue it. In Jesus' name, amen.